Well, hello everyone. Today I'm going to take a look at the topic of how to create an actual design portfolio if you are a product designer. A portfolio, as you know, is a collection of everything you have created, but I think herein already lies the first hurdle. Not everything goes in, okay? This is a, a portfolio is supposed to be an edited piece and you decide how you showcase yourself with it. Walk you through all the single elements here now, bit by bit. First and foremost, your portfolio is a celebration of your successes as a designer. I'm saying this because I keep seeing students who are including stuff in their portfolios that they're actually not pleased with and that may not look that great. They're putting that in because maybe they haven't got that much, maybe they feel it's more honest to show stuff that went badly. Honestly, folks, don't do that, okay? Forget that. What you want to do here is you want to show all your best stuff that went well, the things you're proud of, the things that show what you're made of and what you can accomplish. So it is a pitch. It is a sales pitch for yourself and your expertise. And you are showing this portfolio so that people understand that you are a professional and that they need you and that you can do stuff for them. And on a side note, it can become a catalog of your accomplishments. Once you've been in the business for 20 years, there'll be hundreds of things in there, hopefully. So that in itself, the range of things that you've done can speak volumes about your abilities. Wherever you may go in future, whichever company, whichever client, if they see something they can relate to, they will be more likely to take you on. So it is a bit of a collection of all your all your areas that you have entered. And it is your way or your piece to communicate your own design philosophy. Now I realize it may be a tall order to ask you, you know, at, a, at an early stage in your career, oh, what is your design philosophy? Because, hey, you know, I mean, there are people who never have one. But I think you should try to have one and you should try to develop one. A design philosophy is actually a fairly simple thing when you think about it. It's about all the values that you embrace and your design portfolio should reflect those values. So if you, for example, believe completely in health and fitness, then your, your portfolio might want to reflect this. Or if you're entirely into ethics or into fair trade stuff and helping the third world, give your portfolio that kind of touch. Everything you show will tell a story about you. Let's look at some useful kinds that you, that you can have. What actually is the portfolio technically? You know, what does it, how does it manifest? I think the best place to start always is a PowerPoint file. A PowerPoint file is a wonderful thing because it can be read by pretty much all computers we have. It is editable. It is a file that has proven to be durable. They don't change these things very easily. If you have a 10 year old one, it'll still be fine. And it's quite compatible. It will accept all sorts of things. As you can see on this example, you can even do a voiceover one. Yeah, I'm doing this presentation here in PowerPoint as we speak. There is only one thing about PowerPoint files that you may want to keep in mind. Um, they can have compatibility problems. So if you are making a PowerPoint presentation on a Mac, and then you're putting that on a USB stick and you're taking it away and you're holding a presentation on a PC, you may lose your images. This has actually happened to me and it was a terrible experience. So it is a much better idea to save it as something else 
if you're going to take it away for a presentation, but we'll come to that. Another thing I wrote here, do not distribute. I would say if you're going to send away a PowerPoint presentation, only do so maybe to yourself or to somebody you're working with, because what can easily happen in a PowerPoint presentation is that people will shift things around, people can make changes and then resave. And then what? You know, then somebody has actually tampered with your work and you don't want. So the thing to go with once you're done creating it in PowerPoint is a PDF file, in my opinion. A PDF file simply creates an image of whatever it sees on the PowerPoint page and it's all locked in. So that means a PDF file will not be editable. You can email it away more easily than a PowerPoint, often because PowerPoints, when they have lots of images in them, get huge. You, you, you may have uh, 30, 40 megabytes on your hands. And, and then how, does that going, how is that going to go anywhere by email if you have a cap of 10 megabytes or what? So PDF files will usually be smaller in size than PowerPoints. They will also pass the spam filters and the, 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 the more paranoid companies more easily because you cannot really embed virus code in PDFs very easily. So if they have overzealous virus software, it is probably going to pass master through that more easily than a PowerPoint presentation would. And also, if you're going to make your presentation on a Mac and then you're taking it to a PC, if it's a PDF, everything will be visible. You don't lose imagery and components when you're showing it as a PDF. You can create an online portfolio, although it has to be said that proper design agencies don't usually look at these. I have no idea why. It's just what we are told by industry. They don't look at online portfolios, but they are still good to have because you may find yourself in a situation where you meet an interesting person you know, at a dinner or something and you're like, oh, I wish I could access my portfolio now just with my phone. Well, if you have an online portfolio, you and there are some classic places to look for these and to put these up. The, the classic, I think, is coroflot.com. That's, I think, at, at the, as of the date of me saying all this here, that is uh, the standard place to look for design stuff if you're a product designer. It's mostly America-centered, but perhaps that's where you are or where you prefer. And they do other countries as well. People still have this obsession about printed portfolios. Me, I don't touch these things. Um, they're a waste of money. They look old-fashioned. They're cumbersome to carry around. You can spill coffee on them easily. You can lose them. But if you absolutely want one, obviously you'll want to make a good one. Give yourself to no illusions. It's going to be expensive as hell. A, a really nice portfolio that you can be proud of and that you can make an impression with is going to run you, I'd say, between 100 and 300 US dollars. And it is not easily updated. So I'm not sure if I would ever invest in a printed. So that was the physical side of it. Now let's look at what actually goes in there and how you do it. First of all, before you do anything, make sure you have a CV. Have a CV that makes sense, lists all your relevant components. Yeah, you don't want to, it, it doesn't, I mean, if you've been a waiter or if you've been a barista, that's nice. But I'm not sure if it is going to be relevant to your design career. Maybe it is, but you will have to make that case. Have a CV and put it in there. Make it part of your portfolio. The other thing is everything you've ever done as a designer should be recorded in such a way that it can be shown in a portfolio. So if you made a model, if you made a sketch, scan it, photograph it and do it well. 
don't just use your phone and do it, you know, with your mates in the background. You want every single one of these pieces that you've created to be photographed and scanned in the best possible way because you'll be glad to have them. You may lose them. They may get destroyed and you'll be glad that you did it. I, I'm really glad I did this with all my stuff over the past 25 years. And uh, some of these are still perfectly fit and, and suitable for a current portfolio. So what I do <clears throat> is I, I have a data bank where I keep all these. So these are all actual digital photos that I took of, of sketches and scribbles that I, that I created. And not all of them will make it into my portfolio, but you never know what kind of project or client you will try to appeal to. So keep it all around and uh, be prepared to rummage through your old treasures and uh, create portfolios also based on new positions that you're specifically gearing up for. Um, I think I have something like 50 or 60,000 images like that by now that just comes together in 25 years if you keep making things. And um, I don't just store them on my one laptop either. I have them on every single one of my laptops, on every single one of my desktops. I've got them on Facebook. I've got them on Flickr. I've got them on Google Drive. They're everywhere, right? I mean, <clears throat> I, I cannot avoid my own stuff. It, I'm going to trip over it wherever I go, and that's how you want it. Because how you're living professionally. You need your things. Another thing you can do, obviously, if you have uh, physical things, store them, store them well. Yeah, I, I have a few tote boxes in the basement, plastic tote boxes with moisture eating sachets because you don't want stuff to get moldy on you. You'd be amazed what happens to models. They get eaten by cockroaches. Uh, mice will live in them, uh, they get moldy, uh, they might fall apart, as a friend of mine said, just by looking at them real hard or switching on the light, you know, the, gl the, the glue dries out, uh, things uh, get pale. So don't have very high hopes for the durability of your physical models unless you make them to last. I wouldn't bank on that. So if you have physical models, by all means, keep them, but make sure you have photographed them in the best possible way. Keeping them on the computer, like I said before, is a good idea, but be the only thing you do. Have them on your laptop at all times, because who knows, you might need them while you work, while you travel but not just there. Like I said before, make sure they're also available to you in computing clouds, on external hard drives. Me, I have like five different external hard drives in four different locations, <laughs> just in case one burns down or somebody steals one or whatever. You cannot get paranoid enough about these things because when they're gone, they're gone. And I'm a huge fan of cloud computing. So if you can put stuff on the Dropbox or Google Drive or Flickr or whatever, I mean, Flickr is a photo site, right? But in the end, what are our JPEGs? They are photos. So you can you can put that there and even share it and uh, use Flickr as, a, as an exhibition space for yourself. Google Drive has one issue, it's quite limited in storage. So what can you put on when you only have 15 GB? Well, you might actually be surprised. Uh, if you create a, a proper work portfolio for yourself, you can get away with 30 pages and that might have no more than five megabytes. So you can create updated portfolios again and again and again and put them up there and they will amass there and uh, they will fit just fine five megabytes and 15 gb but that's nothing you will have enough space for that coroflot like i mentioned is another place where you can upload your portfolios 
they, I think, don't really let you upload PDFs, but they have an actual upload function where you can create a pretty professional-looking homepage for yourself with embedded images and captions. Facebook, I know a lot of people go, oh my God, he's putting it on Facebook. That's crazy. It all belongs to them then. Actually, I don't think it does. As far as I understand, Facebook uh, stuff is yours, uh, no matter what people think. And I think I have something like four or 5,000 images lying around on Facebook. It's incredibly convenient. And if you're connecting to interesting people, they can immediately see what you're capable of. And they can bring up your profile and show you around, and they will. LinkedIn is a wonderful thing as well. I, I tend to refer to LinkedIn as Facebook for adults, as a professional uh, networking site. And they may not let you post lots of images, but you can create a good background of your, of your main page, and you can embed links, links to online portfolios that you may have. Now let's look at some of the more nitty gritty stuff of the things that go into your portfolio. <clears throat> I would say never use a sketch straight unless you're an absolute divine sketch god. And there are people who can sketch that well that you don't need to do anything to the sketches in Photoshop. But actually, you will probably find that some functions in Photoshop will be great on almost any sketch. This one here is my favorite. You find it with the pathway filter, artistic, poster edges. It turns whatever you put there into something that looks a bit more like a like comic or like a cartoon. It strengthens all the lines and it simplifies all the shading. Another thing that I sometimes do is when I paste stuff in. In Photoshop you get a, an automatic layer when you paste in an image. I reduce the transparency of the image so that whatever is underneath it shines through and it makes it more complex which is hugely more satisfying to the eye and it takes out the, the starkness um, of, the, of the drawing. It just makes it more adult and more interesting to look at. So here's a really sloppy sketch, but I've reduced the transparency of that to show some marker streaks underneath, and it's great. You can also start pasting st stuff in so that you get like a collage effect. You know, turn them a little. You can rotate the images a little bit by that. This one image here, by the way, is just one sketch, and I have pasted that in over and over with different degrees of transparency and before you know it one good looking sketch becomes a whole world of cool stuff and it, it sells and resells the same sketch over and over which may be a good idea to point out certain features. Here's a sketch that I have airbrushed in Photoshop and you'll agree it, it does amazing things for it, doesn't it? It just gives this glass area a real sense of credibility. And it was just one little touch with the brush tool. The sketch when you do all that, okay? So you go from very quickly. And even though this one here is not very well done, you get the point, I think, of how much more you can do to a hand sketch. You just quickly put it through Photoshop and spend three minutes. So these are all hand sketches that were colored or colorized using Photoshop. You can tint an image, for example. Here, this used to be just a line drawing, and I shaded it in Photoshop, and then I uh, gave it some some tint, which you can do in the color balance tool. Now here's a page where you have a number of sketches pushed together as a collage with nice composition. Composition is an art in itself, but I think if you are conscious about the white space that you leave, 
you have already gone a long way in making it look good. So if you can cover your white space without making it too busy, just a few more images what goes in. Could you use CAD to get better sketches for your portfolio? Now, let me make one thing straight here. There is no such thing as cheating. Nobody cares how hard you made it on yourself to create a visualization. What they want to see is that the visualization expresses your idea. How you got there, nobody cares. So I think if you have trouble drawing good perspective, and I suppose almost everybody does once the object is complex enough and once you're under pressure time-wise, why not? Do something like this. Create a good CAD model. Ah, not even a good CAD model. Create a CAD model, for crying out loud, of the most basic shapes that you've got there. This image. Take it into Photoshop, and I have actually just increased the thresholds on it. There is a function in Photoshop called Threshold. And you bring that up, and before you know it, bam, you have perfect line drawings and some rough shading. And it becomes really worth doing once you have complex objects, like a car, for example. When I, when I build cars, or when I have to do car design, I, I make myself a rough model of a car. Admittedly, this one looks complex now, but I have such practice building cars that I can build one of these in about 15 minutes and then you end up with a, a rough model of your car with the wheels on and you know good mag wheels on and you choose a good perspective it's very important that you find the settings of whatever CAD program you're using do this you really want to have the wide angle look for a car you know that frog eye look that exaggerated coming at you type of thing that that goes on this lens length here refers to the old-fashioned format of 35 millimeter cameras i'm not sure if a lot of people remember what those are but just uh, to give you an indication if you want to make a car look good and give it the right uh, vanishing point distortion to look professional put in a length a lens length of i'd say between 19 and at least 40 millimeters so 19 to 40 millimeters could get you a nice wide angle lens distortion in your car renderings like this All right so then you have that typical car drama look and we, we can tell this is a very dirty cat model with there's a lot wrong here there are creases here and there and things just don't line up but we don't care because we are not using this as a cat model we are using this to help us sketch now as you remember i have built this in like 15 minutes and the wonderful thing is you can keep turning this whichever way you want to and uh, you can create more well, 10, 15 different perspectives of the same vehicle and print them all off and use them as underlays to sketch over. And you will have perfect vanishing lines, as I said, in Photoshop, right? Now, what you do in Photoshop is you use that filter that I described before. You bring that, that rendering in there, that sh roughly shaded rendering, and you hit filter, artistic poster edges and you get your thingy that looks like this right so already you have your lines in it and just look at how perfect these these wheels line up just getting that right by hand drawing takes one hell of a lot of practice which not everybody may have and then you get to this stage by simply increasing brightness and contrast so there you have a uh, white piece of paper with lines on it and this you just print off 20 times and you put in all your detail it saves you so much time you can also 
start doing some of the more advanced shading. Some people think, oh yeah, there is an airbrush tool in Photoshop. And yeah, of course, you can do digital sketching with an airbrush tool and you can make it come to a point and stuff. Because I think that's just way too much gadgetry for my taste. I'm just using the Polygon Lasso. I set it to a high feather amount, as you can see up there. This is the feather. And that gives me a fuzzy selection, and I simply bring up or down the brightness of it, and that gives me a wonderfully controlled area that is shaded like that. Now, sketching onto printouts can look like that. These were all these, these the, the models I'm showing you now are all based on these quick and dirty Rhino car CAD models. And as you can see here, I have actually put in the lines for the door seams and for the, for the windows and stuff after I printed them off. So th these are the kinds of variations that you can then do. And the beautiful thing is if it goes wrong or if you don't like it, well, you just chuck it in the bin and try another one. You can print off as many of these as you like. Print is your friend. And you get this strikingly perfect perspective. You have no nonsense shading that kind of comes with the CAD model. So it's a good trick. Photographing models. Now here we have a model that I built from blue foam and I bundled it all up as they say in the States and painted it with uh, automotive paint. And then I actually waited for uh, dawn and I, I made the ground wet, as you can see there with a hose in front of my garage in, in Pasadena. and. Uh, I just photographed this thing in the glorious morning light. So staging a proper photo set is definitely worth it. And all the other magic that you see in there, all the detail, yeah, you know, you have door seams here and you have uh, mag wheels. None of that was actually there in the photo. There were no headlights, there were no tail lights, there was no brake light, there was no indicator, nothing. This is all Photoshop magic. So don't you go thinking that the photo is it. No, you will need to do stuff to your photo in Photoshop. Because again, it's not about showing a photo of the real thing. It's about showing how your object is supposed to look in the end. And you can fight dirty. You can use whatever means will get you there, okay? So this is a lot of trickery here and just a chunk of painted up blue foam in front of a garage in California. How can you showcase your CAD models? Once you have CAD models, you'll want to make sure people realize you have them and they were valuable. So what I do is when I have one good CAD model, I turn it and I take snapshots of it as often as I can with consistent good lighting. Once you've got your your lighting set up and your, your shading assigned, there is nothing keeping you back from rendering the hell out of this thing. Why not have 30 renderings of the same thing if you can make it mean something? Uh, you know, zoom in on it, show details, use drama in terms of perspective. Um, show a few of these at the same time, paste the same model in over and over, make it look like there's a group of them. It, it just gets better the more you apply yourself to this. You can play with emotion there here. This is a, a race boat interior with a bit of water in the background. I mean, I sometimes even paste in <clears throat> pretty backgrounds like Monaco and things like that. Make it look like a proper photo. Celebrate the object. <clears throat> Let's show that, the finished thing. But why not actually show how you got there? I do a lot of that. I take a lot of uh, screen prints while I work. I put notes on them 
in Photoshop, like you can see here in this one, just because it swells your body of process work, and it is always impressive to see process. There may be CAD operators sitting on the board that you're trying to impress who get a lot more out of these dirty process things than out of the highly polished final ones. No need to keep it a secret how you got there. I would just keep taking screenshots and keep taking photos as you do anything you do. It's all evidence that helps explain how you think, how you work, and how you got there. That includes showcasing your overall work process, such as everything. Can you clay model? Oh, have, a, have a mate photograph you with a clay model. And as you're making it, um, have somebody photograph you, you know, knee deep in dust in the workshop, like we see in this image here, where I'm photographed in the in the model workshop of a prototype studio where I once worked. Some words on IT conventions regarding portfolios. First of all, try to stay under five megabytes. And yes, you can. If you're making your portfolio in a PowerPoint presentation and you have no more than 30 pages, even at a good resolution, once you save that as a PDF, optimized it will be around five megabytes with 30 pages and that will clear any email portal quite easily and really only ever send away pdfs if you're going to send your portfolio to somebody pdfs can be opened by anybody they won't act up and they usually look pretty good You know how to get a PDF slideshow, obviously. You have two ways. Either you start in PowerPoint. When you set up your PowerPoint presentation, make sure you have a meaningful format. I tend to recommend 16 to 9 because that's pretty much what most of our screens look like these days. Stay away from 4 to 3. That, that's ancient. Who cares about that stuff? Go 16.9, that's the, the most common screen size these days. Choose a good background style and really don't do stuff like this. You know, nobody wants to see anything pre-made. There are all these default um, backgrounds available in PowerPoint. Stay away from them. You don't want that. Um, I would use a solid color. Perhaps something that looks backlit, but definitely not something that already has graphic design in it. You don't want that. It's unprofessional. And then text. Now, you will need to choose a good typeface because we designers are very cynical people and there will be very cynical people at the receiving end of your portfolio. And you really don't want to get caught with something like Times New Roman or Comic Sans. So avoid those like the plague. And if you really don't know what to use, I would think you're reasonably safe always with Helvetica and perhaps Arial and Calibri. The pictures that you insert need to be good enough so that you don't need to extrapolate them. Extrapolate means making them bigger than they came. Because if you do that, you're going to lose your resolution. It's going to get fuzzy, it's going to get pixeled, and they will think that you don't know what you're doing. So make sure your images have the right size. The right size should be a minimum of 1600 pixels in width. If you have 1600 pixels in width, you will clear pretty much all laptop screens and computer screens these days with reasonable quality and it stays manageable and small enough for your portfolio to be uh, email material. Name your portfolio file in a meaningful way. What I, for example, always do is I start off with the date in this fashion, year, month, day, 
then I do underscore because that helps you clear a few IT hurdles that might exist in some, some software or, or uh, databases. Then you add your surname and you add what that thing is that you are showing. Portfolio, right? So date, surname, portfolio. Like that. And what you do is you go save as PDF, right? So that is the final step that you do when you have finished your PowerPoint presentation. You save as a PDF. There is another way to arrive at a PowerPoint presentation. Some people aren't happy with the way Microsoft PowerPoint um, tends to prescribe to you how to do stuff and how to align stuff and they may want to do something more free so if you're considering something like Adobe Photoshop your easel and you prefer to put it together in that you can of course do that you can create yourself a good format in something like Photoshop create a folder where you have all your single slides maybe pre-save them so that you have slides 1 to 30 with nothing in them yet so that they are strategic and you create maybe a background artistically interesting background in your photoshop file that you use for every single one of these make sure they're all saved in a string of pearls like I said so that you can just open them one after another and fill them with the content that you intend. In the end I would say always flatten all your layers. You get there by in Photoshop at least by going layer, flatten layer, save the thing as a JPEG and so on you just keep going <coughs> until you're done. And then you open Acrobat, you choose Combine Files into PDF, and then you bring in all these JPEGs that you have just created, add them in, combine them, and save the whole caboodle as your PowerPoint presentation that has originated in Adobe Photoshop done. A few words on layout. What is that thing, layout? Um, some would say, ah, oh, that's something graphic designers do. But the thing is, they won't forgive you, the product designer, if it doesn't look right. So what we can do is we can use a standard layout that you use on every single one of your portfolio slides. I would tend to do something like this. You have the majority of the page dedicated to your image and then captions all around it that give the information that you need. Now that should be in the same exact same location every time so that it doesn't jump around as you go from page to page in your presentation. And you put on all these things which design school you're in, or if you're a professional, which company, what project name that is. You might include a description of it on the right here. You'll put on a date and your name, of course, most importantly, your name, okay. And I have mentioned font or typeface before. Here's an example of what not to use. This is Times New Roman and forget it it doesn't exist okay they invented this i don't know why probably once upon a time when we were still printing with ink and it made the printing less 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 blotchy in the 19th century and made the the ink flow better i think but there is absolutely no reason for us to use this font today unless you're writing a book or a paper and submitting it to a journal so forget that kind of thing. Serif font 
is any font that has little hooks and things jutting off it and we don't use them as designers yeah we get executed for doing that so you don't want to bring that upon yourself no serif what is okay is sans serif and that means no little hooks and things that are jutting off okay and i think if you're going with calibre or ariel or helvetica and the other happy ones from the family they should serve you well keep in mind that they also have their own character and that that says something about you and those who understand more about typeface may read a lot into that uh, the typeface that you choose may say a lot about you politically as a person and so on so read up on what history goes with them and then choose wisely which one of them represents you in your portfolio here are a few that exist i think you should just choose one it's a bad idea to choose fonts from what i know graphic designers will always frown upon it so don't descriptions what kinds of descriptions should go onto each one of your portfolio page i would say look at the stuff in red here you can pause the video and take your time jot it down if you like keywords numerical data performance data um, it should be big enough so you can actually read the description from afar not everybody will be staring at a screen like you may be doing now they might be sitting across a room looking at a projection there should be a reasonably tasteful background no kittens no stars no graphic design stuff off the shelf okay and it should look relevant to the project so the whole vibe of the page need to be right for what you're showing on that page with the color scheme that you're choosing and, uh, and any other cues that you might give so here is an example let's say the product is fiberglass elephant then you would put these kinds of data on the right yeah this is a fully filled in sheet pretty much fully filled in and that is it and i hope you found that useful um, best of luck with your portfolios and may you get into whatever you want to get into